it's more going to be OCT. That's where you're going to really be dealing with diarrhea and constipation and medication. People come in age restriction and things of that nature. Now, if you know your OCT principles, then this should be a breeze. Constipation, again, you will have to know your different types of laxatives and how to manage constipation in short term versus long term. Um, opioid induced constipation, pregnancy and children. You will also definitely need to be able to give examples of the laxatives found in each one of these classes. Okay, you need to know your treatment ladder as well when treating stomach acids, starting from antacids to H2 blockers and then PPIs. And you need to be able to give counseling points for stomach acid, knowing when to take the medication and what to do to help reduce stomach acid. It's very important to know about H. pylori eradication and the treatment. Now, when I was revising, what I did was I have, I have a book in which I write down the most important uh, BNF ideas to learn. So this is this is going beyond just memorizing or putting everything into chapters. There are things in the BNF that you just absolutely need to know. And I'll give you an example. So if I look at my book, which I All right, so reducing exocrine secretions, you are likely to get math questions on this, as I was just saying. So you just need to know what it is so that as you see these questions come up, you understand the clinical basis behind these questions. All right, so let's jump into another question. So the first question, we got nine out of nine, and now we've got more people in the chat. So I expect to see more people interacting. So I'm just going to run the second question. Okay. This should appear on your screen in just a moment. All right, so the question's on the screen. It says a defender or protector against peptic ulcer disease might include, and you have four options, bicarbonate, H. pylori, NSAIDs, or pepsin. Five out of 12 people have voted, six out of 12, come on, seven, yep. Yeah. Okay, okay, it's looking good so far. It's looking good so far. Again, this is a straightforward and easy question. Uh, I'm sure you guys have, I'm sure you guys have um, revised most of this. Eight out of thirteen people. I'm going to give you just. You've got another, got another thirty seconds to get everyone's vote in before we look at the answer. Just three more people to cast a vote. Um, I'm really curious to know what you guys think and know because this is how we we test what needs to be discussed all right so just two more votes so we have everyone just 10 more seconds i'll give you 10 more seconds and then we'll look at the results and see what everyone has voted for two people haven't voted by the way guys if you're having technical issues technical problems we've got an admin in the chat so just type into the chat and he should be able to help you out with this but normally it shouldn't be a problem if you're in the meeting you should be able to vote just fine all right so we two people didn't vote but we'll end the poll now 
Um, so most people say bicarbonate and really and truly just one person went for pepsin, which is okay. But let's look at the answer and try and understand what's happening here. So the actual answer is bicarbonate. Now bicarbonate raises the pH protecting against ulceration. The pH scale, for those who don't know, but most of us do know since we've done uh, A-level chemistry, one foot long is like a, think of it as one as a one foot long ruler with 12 lines instead of 12, okay? Zero sits on the left side, which is the most acidic compound, and 14 sits on the, on the right side, which is the most basic compound or the most alkaline compound. Seven is in the middle and that's neutral. Now stomach acid, for those that don't know, has a pH of about 2. Milk, on the other hand, has a pH of about 6. Um, and neutral is 7, as I said. So the, the blood, the blood in your body is about a 7.35. So, the, so why would you give dairy milk, um, which is slightly... Why would you give dairy milk? Because it's slightly acidic and it helps to calm stomach acid. It's, it's still slightly acidic, but it's less acidic than stomach acid, which is a pH of 2. So in other words, when you give milk, it raises the pH. Now because six, because like I said, six is more basic than two. H. pylori, a, which we spoke about in the last question, is a helicobacter shaped organism. And NSAIDs, like for example, ibuprofen, aproxim, pepsin, and pepsin, um, all these help to contribute to ulceration. So the other things, H. pylori, um, NSAIDs, and pepsin will all help to contribute to um, H. pylori, so it's quite the opposite. The opposite of the last question we had. Again, another straightforward and easy question. If there's any questions about this, just let me know in the chat. So we proceed. So peptic ulcers are open source. You may not know what they are actually, but they're, um, just go on Google and look at an image or a video. They're like open sores in the stomach that develop inside the lining of your stomach and the upper portion of the small intestine. The most common symptoms of a peptic ulcer is going to be stomach pain. Uh, they, can they can include gastric ulcers. Gastric ulcers occur in the inside of the stomach and you can also have duodenal ulcers that occur on the inside of the upper proportion of your, of your small intestine, also known as du duodenum. Now the most common causes of peptic ulcers are infection with the bacterium H. pylori, we've discussed this, and also the long-term use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs known as NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen and naproxen. Um, stress and spicy foods, now this is a, a key difference here, stress and spicy foods do not cause peptic ulcers, however, they can make the symptoms slightly worse. So if you've already got the acid, they can aggravate those symptoms. And that's why we advise over the counter to avoid such foods. Not that they cause it, but they aggravate. Okay, I've got another question here coming for you guys. I'm gonna run this one straight forward. I think we kind of get the hang of how the questioning system works. So it says, sometimes the easiest way to calm an upset stomach is to go over the counter. A patient complains of diarrhea and stomach indigestion which, um, which um, you suggest which antacid? Read the question carefully. This one, we've already got a, an uneven split. You wanna read the question carefully. All right, so this one is a bit more about exam technique. Okay, it's a bit of tricky. It's a, it's a bit of a tricky one. It's easy, and I'm sure you all know the principles behind it. But I'm getting various answers here because, again, it's about the way the question is phrased. Sometimes the easiest way to calm an upset stomach is to go over the counter. Now, a patient complains of diarrhea and stomach indigestion. You suggest which antacid? All right, we've got seven seven votes out of thirteen. I'm going to give you another thirty seconds. If you all could vote very fast, we could go through this a lot quicker. But yeah, take your time. Um, exam conditions. <laughs> I'm not trying to stress you out. Just three more people to vote and I'll give you the right answer. So we've got um, literally every option here has been voted for, which is quite interesting. I'm going to give you another 10 seconds for the last two people to cast their vote. You know, if you don't understand the question, or if you don't know the answer, don't worry about it. I'll be going over the answer anyway. Okay, let's look at what the answer might be. Now, let's look at the results, right? Um, so, we've had uh, four people voted for uh, esomeprazole, and one person voted for famotidine, and five people voted for calcium carbonate, and you know, one person voted for propyl ethylene 
glyco. So guys, what was the trick here? The, the thing is that calcium, the correct answer is calcium carbonate, okay? Um, calcium carbonate is actually the only antacid on the list and it's especially good for someone with uh, diarrhea. Besides, besides acting as an antacid, calcium carbonate can also supplement calcium in the diet. You may also see it as a diet supplement. Esomeprazole, for those that voted for esomeprazole, that is actually a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor, and we'll get to that later. But I said reading the question is key. Formotidine, on the other hand, is a H2 blocker, not an antacid, and propyl ethylene glycol is a laxative. Um, they're all over the counter, you can all get them over the counter, but none of them, none of these other options are antacids. Like I said, um, calcium carbonate is can be used for, uh, you know, sub supplementing calcium as we know calcium is good for strong bones um, the most widely mechanism that is but PPIs on the other hand PPIs uh, they can actually cause in the long run if you use them for a long time they can cause osteoporosis and fractures um, the reason why I looked into this the, I think the most commonly assumed mechanism no one really knows for sure is that the long-term use of PPIs can lead to decreased absorption of calcium and which can result in a, a reduced level of calcium inside and also it leads to osteoporosis. Does calcium cause constipation? We'll actually be looking at a quick mnemonic in a, in a quick in, a, in the next slide. So we'll look at what antacids cause um, like what antacids um, cause uh, constipation and which ones can cause uh, diarrhea. All right. So for one of the first things in the old BNF, I think the BNF, the I, I think they've changed the order around ever so slightly, depending on which BNF you have with you right now. Um, PPI I thought was hypomagnesium. Yes, that's one of them. Um, and I've actually got a slide on on PPIs. So PPIs can cause a number of side effects in the long run, um, and the different PPIs have different pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and that's important to know why the differences between the PPIs okay but I've got a slide on PPIs um, towards the end um, yeah so celiac disease um, I, I, I don't do I don't deal with uh, the breads and the food supplements anymore I, I don't know if they're still on the NHS if you can still get them maybe you guys do that in your pharmacy I'm not sure if they're still prescribable but for celiac disease celiac disease is a condition where your immune system attacks your own tissues when you eat gluten this damages your gut or your small intestines and then you're unable to take in certain nutrients. Celiac disease can cause a range of symptoms including, including diarrhea, abdominal pain and bloating. There is no specific cure for celiac disease but following a gluten-free diet should, be, should help control the symptoms and this is why they used to prescribe these gluten-free supplements to people with celiac disease like Juvella bread and you have the cereals as well. Even if you have mild symptoms like uh, mild symptoms of celiac disease changing your diet is still recommended because if you continue to eat gluten it can lead to serious complications uh, it may also be the case it may also be the case that um, you may have tests done that show that you have a small degree or some degree of celiac disease but if you, if you have any uh, degree of celiac disease whether you have noticeable symptoms or, or not it, it is advised that you avoid gluten that's all there is to learn about celiac disease really um, there's nothing much I think you'll be tested on so we'll move on and we'll go to the next question question number four let's launch the polling uh, taking a medicine at night time can be critical to it working properly when telling a patient when to take uh, omeprazole you say he or she should take it Wow somebody really knows their stuff because somebody went straight to the right answer before I even finish re reading it so Props to you. Props to you. So if you guys have been to pharmacy skills, we do have these uh, mnemonics, uh, the printouts um, and, and the video as well on our YouTube channel where we actually uh, show a quick way of remembering the antacids and when to take them. Um, uh, ashamedly, I do not have the mnemonic at the top of my head, but um, I will <laughs> perhaps be sharing that in the group later on. 
All right, so, okay, we have had two more people enter the room. We're at 18, we're at 18 people, that's great. So I'm just gonna give those people that just entered the room a chance to vote as well. Guys, for those guys that have just entered, um, we're looking at the GI system and we're doing polls as we're going by to kind of gauge your level of understanding. So what you have in front of you, um, if you just entered the room, I'm not sure if you can see the, the question in front of you, but there's a question on screen and you just need to click on what you think is the right answer. I'm giving everyone another 10 seconds to vote. Okay, we've had 11 out of 16 people vote. That means five people have still yet to vote. All right, while I'm giving the other people that have just joined in a chance to kind of get settled down and relax, I'm just gonna go ahead and um, show the answers for this poll, okay? All right, so most people, nine people voted for 30 minutes before a meal, and we had a few people vote for with a meal and one to three hours before a meal. Um, the correct answer for this question is actually um, C, which is 30 minutes before a meal. Um, omeprazole is best taken 30 minutes before a meal to prevent significant acid from forming in the first place, right? Um, now what some of you might be thinking of when you voted for one to three hours after a meal is the antacids so you would take the antacids um one to three one to three uh, hours after a meal starts producing acid okay i hope that's clear but yeah hello very close oh, hello Hello, did you want to say something? Yeah, please, sorry, could you repeat the reason behind the 30 minutes before food? Um, it's just to prevent, uh, prevent before significant acid starts um, to be produced. It, it's how fast they act. Um, so the esomeprazole, you'd want to take it 30 minutes before the, the acid actually starts building because it would take that much time to suppress the acid. Whereas, um, to prevent you from having the symptoms, whereas the antacids, you can take them after the meal, they're pretty quick acting. And it's for light, um, small acids, where, whereas the PPI will be for significant amount of acid production. Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. All right, guys. So one of the things you look at first in the, I think the NF80, the one that you guys might have is um, diverticular disease. Uh, diverticulosis so this is a bit of a weird concept to understand if you just go straight into the BNF so I'd recommend maybe watching a video or reading about it first because it, it's so much simpler to understand now diverticulosis is when pockets um, called diverticular sometimes form in the wall of, of your digestive tract so the inner layer of your intestine pushes through the weak layer or the weak spots in the outer lining of your layer and bulges out uh, and then this pressure then makes it looks like a bulge on the intestine essentially i don't have a good picture of it uh, it makes little pouches or pockets which uh, sometimes often happens in the col colon but can happen in the lower part of your large intestine as well now when it comes to non-drug treatment for diverticulosis it's going to be about the diet that you eat so what is recommended is whole grains uh, low fiber um, and a gradual increase of fiber. So you start small and then gradually increase um, to minimize flutulence and bloating. As you can see, it's really trying to treat and prevent the symptoms from getting worse. And obviously you wanna drink plenty of fluid. Other recommendations include exercise and lose weight if you're obese, smoking cessation. Diverticular disease um, is recommended that you go for high fiber diet and divertic diverticulitis. The difference is the itis part, which implies inflammation. So if you have diverticular, so which implies infection, not inflammation, my fault. Um, diverticulitis may also require surgery if it gets significantly worse. Now for drug treatment for diverticulosis, we have no specific treatment, but like I said, bulk forming laxatives, which will help reduce flutulence and bloating. And for diverticular disease, it's gonna be a similar thing, bulk form, forming um, laxatives, as well as um, simple analgesia and maybe antispasmatics and uh, just to reduce uh, the symptoms. Now for diverticulitis, like I said, this is when the, the pockets that have bulged through the intestine become inflamed or infected. 
and it can cause severe pain. So for this, you may require antibiotics to treat it. Okay, um, the, you won't really be questioned on the pharma co uh, on the pathophysiology of diverticulitis or diverticulosis. I'm just going over it so that we have a solid understanding. But um, don't worry too much about it. Like I said, maybe you watch a video on it and it will be uh, easy to understand. All right, so let's jump to the next question. So the next question is going to be on chelation. So the question says, uh, chelation, on the binding of two medicines is one such reaction. A patient is on fluoroquinolone antibiotic and you are concerned about chelation if you see this medicine in the chart. So which one of these medicines would make you worried about a chelation reaction? Docusate sodium, esomeprazole, famotidine or magnesium hydroxide. It's a bit of a tricky one, not too tricky though, but it's similar to the last one. You need to know the difference between your drug classes, antacids, PPIs, and H2 blockers. So while we're voting, I'll give you a quick re reason why. Um, so you're looking for, this is a clue. You're looking for elements that have some kind of a charge because when they have some kind of a charge, then they can bind to other chemicals or other compounds. Somebody changed the <laughs> somebody changed their vote. I didn't even know you could do that. So we have 10 out of 16 people who voted. Uh, okay, 11. Five more people to vote. 12. Just four more people to vote. I'll give you another 10 seconds to cast your vote. And then we'll discuss what we think the answer is. three more people to vote even if you don't know what the answer is go ahead and just guess what you think the answer is because you will more more than likely remember it next time even if you if you get it wrong than if you just look at the answer okay uh, i'm going to end it here two people didn't vote but that's fine 14 people did vote uh 10 people voted for magnesium hydroxide and we had about one one vote or two votes for the others and that's perfectly okay the actual correct answer is d magnesium hydroxide which is also known as milk of magnesia now this is an antacid and it can bind or chelate so chelate chelating is a binding reaction it can bind with antibiotics like tetracyclines you might be aware of this um for example, tetracyclines include doxycycline and minocycline, or it can also bind, bind with fluoroquinolones, for example, ciprofloxacine or levofloxacin. Milk of magnesium looks like dairy milk. If you look at it, um, it works similarly to an antacid in calming stomach acid, as I've said. Uh, all of the antacids carry the same risk as well. So um, aluminium, magnesium, aluminium, anything with a positive charge can have a chelation side effect. Okay, that's why these chelation side effects occur. So esomeprazole, famotidine, and docusate sodium uh, are not charged elements like magnesium, aluminium, calcium, and those ones, okay? It's, a, it's just a chemistry thing. <laughs> it's just a chemistry thing. It's as basic as I can put it. I hope that's clear. Um, but like I said, you know what? We will be coming across chelation reactions when we look at antibiotics as well and other chapters um, when we look at you know, um, when we go over the endocrine system as well, we'll, come up, we'll, we'll recover some of these things. All right, so now IBD, irritable bowel disease. It's important to differentiate irritable bowel disease from IBS, which we'll look at. Inflammatory bowel disease is a group of conditions that causes swelling irritation in the digestive tract. Um, and it can be, you can either have Crohn's disease or you can have ulcerative colitis. Now, irritable bowel disease, ir sorry, ir irritable bowel syndrome, which is the other one, is a term for symptoms that happen when the when the contents of the large intest intestine move too quickly or too slowly. Remember the difference between syndrome and disease that we looked at earlier on in the first slide. IBD is what doctors call a structural disease. It means that there is like some kind of a some kind of physical damage caused to um, to your body. Uh, doctors can see chronic inflammation when they're looking at IBD. You can see areas of the of the digestive tract that are inflamed, or they can see ulcers when they look at look at it through an X-ray or an endoscopy, 
or biopsy, whereas IBS is a functional disease, right? It's functional disease. Tests won't really show any physical reason for your symptoms. You're having bloating, um, diarrhea, constipation, but there is no actual uh, fun um, structural damage to your to your digestive system. So um, some of the drugs used, and like I said, we'll be covering these drugs in later modules as well. But we have drugs like sulfasalazine, which is a combination of 5-aminosalicylic <laughs> acid and sulfur. For pyridine. So the sulfapyridine part of it is a carrier and it's what causes many of the side effects. You'll notice that now we tend to use the newer amino salicylates like mesalazine and basalazine and osalazine. And the difference between these ones is that they, they avoid the side effects that was initially carried by the sulfapyridine, sulfapyridine or the sulfur molecule. Um, but they can all still cause lupus. They can all still cause the same side effects, just in a lesser degree. Uh, lupus is the, the skin reaction that you get from these drugs. All right, before we jump on to the next section, and we're not done with um, IBD, right? We're going to go into Crohn's and uh, we're going to look at UC as well. But before we do that, I have another question I just want to run for you guys. You may notice that the questions are not always related to the current topic, but that's okay. So the next question says, we have different forms of histamines in our body. Histamine 1 and histamine 2, for example. A histamine 2 receptor antagonist works well to treat what? Nighttime GERD or GERD if you want, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or diarrhea, constipation, or allergy symptoms. It's a bit of a tricky one, but it's really going to help you iron out the two histamine types. Well, I'm glad no one so far has voted for constipation. Um, while you guys are still voting, I just want to give you a quick tip here. Um, one of the ways to remember drugs is to remember the, the suffix of the drugs at the ending of the drug. So when you look at ranitidine, ranitidine for example, you can remember the tidine, T-I-D-I-N-E. That's the actual suffix for the class of drugs, um, for this class of drug. Uh, and you can think of tidine as to dine. That's one of the mnemonics we use to dine, which represents that you would you would eat it, you would use it to treat uh, acid reflux that's caused after you dine or after you eat. All right, 11 out of 17 people have voted. Some people haven't yet voted. Um, going to assume either you don't know the answer or you're having technical issues. But if you've not told us you're having technical issues, then I'll assume you don't know the answer. But that's okay. We'll be going over the answer. 12 people have voted. All right, let's look at what the answer might be. Um, so what people say GERD and people say allergy symptoms and this is perfectly this is kind of what I expected because you have H1 and H2 receptors which are the ones that you need to know about mainly right uh, one of them is going to be allergy symptoms you guys are absolutely correct and one of them is going to be for one of them is going to be um, in the stomach primarily con primarily concentrated in the stomach um, when you take a H2 receptor blocker the active ingredients travel to specific receptors on the surface of the stomach cells that release acid. And then it inhibits certain chemical reactions through these H2 blockers um, so that they aren't able to produce stomach acid. Okay? So a H1 blocker or an antihistamine, like it would be something like loratadine, which would be appropriate for uh, allergy symptoms. So H1 blockers for allergy symptoms and H2 receptor blockers would be the ones that you use to block acid. Does that make sense? Look at the question again. We have different forms of histamines in our body, histamine 1 and histamine 2. A histamine 2 receptor antagonist works well to treat GERD, nighttime GERD. Okay. Now, um, maybe somebody in the chat knows a quick mnemonic to remember this so that you don't forget in future H1. I know people say H1, you have one head and those are the symptoms you have when you have an allergy. Um, 
whatever helps you to remember, honestly, no matter how silly it is, as long as it helps you remember, that should be okay. So we're looking at um, IBD. So one of the one of the categories would be Crohn's disease, and the other one would be UC ulcerative colitis. So with Crohn's disease, we have thickened areas of the gastrointestinal wall with inflammation, and it extends through all the layers of the GI tract. So you have areas where it's not affected, and then you have areas where it is affected, and it extends over a bigger section. So non-drug treatments for Crohn's would include just the things that you would think are common sense, smoking cessation, uh, attention to your diet, and in some cases, even surgery. Remember, surgery is a non-drug treatment. But for drug treatment, uh, we start with monotherapy. You start with one thing. You may start with corticosteroids to help induce remission of the first episode. Now, if corticosteroids are contraindicated, again, this is all in the BNF, but I just made my own slightly uh, condensed notes. If, contraindic if contraindicated, you can give uh, budesonide, which is less absorbed it which is less absorbed and can cause less side effects. Let's say you're taking corticosteroids that are causing serious side effects. Budesonide will cause less side effects because it's less absorbed in the gut and will act at the site where you give it. Or you can give an amino salicylate if that doesn't work out. For add-on therapy, you can, you can, for example, if someone had two or more incidents in the last 12 months, then you'd go, you'd step up and you can give as a thioprene or mecaptopurin um, plus whatever first line medication you were given in the first place and then you under a specialist only you can go and add some of the biologics which include TNF alphas, adalimumab, these are hard to say by the way, and infliximab. Um, here's a quick tip, just remember the ending MAB stands for monoclonal antibody so you know that these are biologics. You also have, if that doesn't work you go to the stronger ones which are vedolizumab and ustekinumumab. And for maintenance therapy, you would have uh, azathioprine or mecaptopurin or even methotrexate long term. Um, along with that treatment, the patient may also be prescribed loperamide and codeine to manage diarrhea or the symptoms. You can also have fistulating, um, uh, you can have fistulating uh, Crohn's or you can have infections. The, the preferred drug to treat infections would be metronidazole or ciprofloxacin. Uh, but metronidazole should be given for one month uh, and usually no more than three months because then you increase the risk of peripheral neuropathy. That's, a, that's an important one to remember for metronidazole is peripheral neuropathy. But we'll be going over that again when we look at, um, when we look at uh, infections. Okay, question seven is on screen right now. It says, often students who do not know that there is an official list of accepted drug stems and drug stems is what we emphasize a lot here. So, students who don't know this uh, accepted list of drug stems for non-proprietary medications, also known as generics, um, sometimes they make, make up stems for a few of the, just basing on, on the few last letters in the name. But to know the proton, but for proton pump inhibitors, the officially accepted stem is, is it Azole, O-L-E, Prazole, or Z-O-L-E? The clue here is to think, is there another drug that has this stem? Because if it's an officially accepted stem, then this should be the only drug that has that stem. Okay, voting is coming on quicker. I love it. I love it. I love that you guys are getting the hang of this. Um, I'm emphasizing stems because it was a game changer for me. Um, learning stems really was a game changer. Uh, drugs can be hard to learn sometimes, but when you see a stem and you recognize stems, um, it just improves your ability to navigate through a question sometimes. Okay, so again, we've had 12 votes, so five people still have yet to vote. Great. 10 seconds and then we'll look at the answer. So the correct answer, actually we've had, um, I'm going to stop the vote in here. Some people said Azo, but the one example I was thinking of is, can anyone guess uh, ketoconazole? Now we all know ketoconazole is an antifungal, but it has the ending Azo. 
So the first one cannot be right. And OLE cannot be right. Ketoconazole has OLE. And the last one cannot be right because ZOLE is also in ketoconazole. But Prazole, P-R-A-Z-O-L-E, or Meprazole, um, Pantoprazole, all have the P-R-A-Z-O-L-E ending, and that's the actual official stem. So now let me, uh, so like I said, uh, Prazole is the official stem for proton pump inhibitors. Uh, the other choices are just not correct because you find them in other drugs. Now when we look at esomeprazole as a drug, esomeprazole is an S isomer. Many drugs have chemical structures that have mirror images of each other. If you, if you think back to chemistry, you may remember enantiomers. Now instead of just calling them left and right, for example, your hands are like enantiomers of each other, right? You have a left and right hand which are mirror images of each other. So instead of just calling one drug an R and so a left and a right side, left-handed or right-handed drug, we call them R and S, which come from the Latin words for right, which is rectus in Latin, and left in Latin will be sinister. So that's where we get R and S from, left and right. Now, in the case of S-omeprazole, S-omeprazole is the S form of omeprazole. Um, so you could actually just write S, the letter omeprazole, but they put ES so that it's clear that you're looking at pronouncing it correctly as S or Meprazole. Um, there's, there's minor differences between them, not very much differences between them. Maybe the way they are broken down in the liver, uh, the way they affect other drugs and drug interactions. But in terms of efficacy, most PPIs are, are the same. Okay, so the next one would be ulcerative colitis. Now, ulcerative colitis, we're just going to read this one off the slide. Is, chronic is a chronic inflammatory condition. Uh, again, it's lifelong. Relapsing and remitting means it comes and it goes. Um, unlike, unlike, um, what was the other one we looked at? With ulcerative colitis, it's really just the colon section. It's in the name colitis. It extends from the rectum upwards. Um, treatment is going to be mainly going to be rectal if it's affecting the rectal area. Um, topically, you would have an amino salicylate as a first option because you don't want to give something systemic when you can treat it topically just to reduce the amount of side effects you may experience. And then you can add corticosteroids and oral corticosteroids uh, or, or then oral corticosteroids. So either topical and then oral corticosteroids. So in terms of knowing the pathophysiology, um, I'm, I'm a bit vague on it because it's not as important as knowing the pharmacology of it. Okay. But if you do have questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right, so we have another question which says, some medications raise pH and others lower pH to affect their response. A proton pump inhibitor has this effect on pH. Okay. Um, not gonna waste okay well we're getting buried answers i was not gonna waste too much time on this one because i thought everyone would remember so remember i said think of the ph scale as one ruler you have the most acidic at the bottom the most alkaline at the top and you have neutral in between so the stomach acid is about two and anything that goes away from two is going to make it less acidic okay so if you made the ph4 when it was two it's going to be less acidic it's going to reduce the signs of um, heartburn, symptoms of heartburn. So anything that moves away from two, that means anything that moves closer to one or closer to two is wrong. Okay, it's all about increasing increasing the uh, the pH. And that, I don't know if you remember the science experiment you did with sodium bicarbonate, um, which is an alkaline. That's why it works as an antacid. Okay, so next we'll look at constipation. Now, all patients that are constipated in general can increase their dietary fiber. Uh, the answer is it raises pH. Uh, let's look. Yes, yeah. So a, a proton pump inhibitor would raise a pH. It would raise the pH in that it would stop acid production. Great. 
Right, so all patients that come to your pharmacy are constipated. Um, the One of the safest things you can do is just ask them to increase the dietary fiber. Um, but you have to be careful when using laxatives because laxatives can lead to hypokalemia. Someone needs to mute their microphone. Uh, bulk forming laxatives include things like bran, ispahula husk, methyl cellulose. Methyl cellulose is also a softener as well. The onset for most bulk forming is about 72 hours. And for adults who can increase their fiber intake further, uh, they can help with small hard stools and can exacerbate flutulence. That's the that's the bad thing about the bulk formings. They can also cause cause bloating and cramping. So you want to make sure that you're maintaining a good fluid intake if you're taking the bulk formings. Now we have stimulant laxatives. Stimulant laxatives are some of the most powerful laxatives. Examples include bisocodile, picosulfate, senna, danthroma, and codanthrusate. Now, codanthrusate is one of those that's not used anymore because of its carcinogenic effects, but it can still be used for people who are terminally ill because of its effectiveness, and you're less worried about the carcinogenicity of it. Um, they work by basically causing your stomach to get moving. They stimulate it um, and cause it to move, which is referred to as motility. But the bad thing about this is if you're forcing it, the stomach to get moving is that you can cause cramps. And, and if there's an obstruction of some kind, you can just make it worse. Um, Docusate is an example of a drug that kind of skirts between the, the classes. So it can act both as a stimulant and a softener. And glycerol can also act as a lubricant and a stimulant by irritation. So some of these do kind of skirt in between classes because they can do multiple things. Um, softeners, these just decrease the surface tension and allow fluid into the into the feces. Examples include, again, docusate and glycerol, arachis oil, liquid paraffin. Um, you have to be careful of liquid paraffin, though, because it can cause um, a, a risk of what is known as um, granulomatous, granulomatous disease or a lipoid pneumonia on aspiration. That means if you breathe it in. Um, osmotic laxatives, uh, these are the ones that you see very commonly in pharmacy and they just help to retain and draw water into the bowel. Um, they're not really, they're not absorbed, but they um, attract water. Um, another thing to know about lactulose though, is that lactulose can be used to prevent the growth of ammonia bacteria. So you can use it if someone has hepatic encephalopathy. Macrogols are also another example of an osmotic laxative. Again, there's a risk of dehydration, so you want to make sure that someone is taking in enough fluid with them. Other drugs that are not mentioned here include linaclotide, which is used in severe cases. It increases, again, the movement um, and also fluid secretion into the extra areas of your stomach to allow smoother transition. Procalopride is also a selective serotonin 5-HT4 agonist with prokinetic properties. It used to be licensed only in women, but I read an article recently that procalopride can now be used in men as well. Um, I think the reason why procalopride was used in women only before was because um, generally women are more constipated. And so the trials that were done with it included women only, but recently they've done trials on men as well. Um, if, if someone has um, uh, other experiments, please share, but the most recent studies I've seen uh, now allow Procalopride to be used in women too. Okay, let's go to the next question, question number nine. The question says, the cause of peptic ulcer disease is important in knowing which medication to give. With NSAID induced ulcer treatment, we expect to see acid reducers alone, one antibiotic, one acid reducer, one antibiotic and two acid reducers, or two antibiotics and one acid reducer. Um, okay, let me just uh, look at some of the comments. Okay, so the question saying that the cause of peptic ulcer disease is important in knowing which medication to give, right? So if someone has NSAID-induced ulcer, what would you see? What would you expect to see? 
it's a tricky question. Um, most people have say two antibiotics. <clears throat> right. Someone said acid reduces the loan. You might want to reread this question because this is um, this is the kind of tricky exam technique I was speaking about that you will have to kind of use on the fly in the exam because you all know the principles. You all know what and and the antibiotics are. Maybe you know what the reduces are, but just the way the question is phrased is what really is getting people here. Because um, for the first time, the majority are, are actually incorrect, and I'll explain why in just a second. Um, we've got five more people that haven't really cast a vote, and it'll be it'll be nice to see what the others think. Whether you're right or wrong doesn't matter. Okay, let's have a look. So um, most people say two antibiotics and one acid reduce, and you're obviously thinking about the uh, the, the the triple therapy re regimen, and that's fine. Except the answer here is going to be acid reduces alone. Um, they would be appropriate with NSAID induced ulcers. Remember the two causes of um, ulcers would be H. pylori and the other would be NSAID induced. Now if someone has H. pylori that's the reason why I would give antibiotics to kill the actual bacteria. But since it's NSAID induced it's not um, caused by H. pylori. That means we don't need to use antibiotics. We only use the acid reducers. I hope that makes sense to you. So yeah, like I said, if H. pylori was a culprit, we would expect to see the two antibiotics. Or sometimes even more. Alright, let's keep going. So constipation continued. So now we've looked at the different medication we can use, but how do we manage the different situations when it comes to constipation? The answer is to reduce... The answer is acid reducer alone. Acid reducer alone. Right, so for short duration constipation, for short duration, yeah, the answer was the first one. You're correct. For short duration constipation, dietary fiber. Now the way I've done it, right? So in my my book, which I have in front of me, is I use I use just the first letters uh, of the actual class of um of laxative and I'll explain to you what I mean in just a second for example if someone has short duration constipation the latter would be dietary fiber then you give them a bulk forming and then you look at osmotic if someone has induced constipation we know that we give them osmotic or we, gi we give them osmotic and a stimulant and we know we want to avoid bulk forming actually there's a specific uh, drug you can give for opioid induced and that last um, naloxone or methyl naltrexone. Uh, for fecal impaction, that is when the stools are extremely hard. You can give macrogol or you can give macrogol and a stimulant to help push it along if the macrogol is not enough. And for hard stools, you can give something in the rectum directly like a glycerol suppository or for soft stools, you might give bisocodyl. Alternatively, alternatively, you can give docusate sodium or citrate enema can also be tried. Even sodium phosphate and arachis oil. Now for chronic constipation, you would give a bulk forming, then you would give a macrogol, lactulose, and then stimulant. It's going up the ladder. Um, if someone's had it for six months and they're having, they've tried two different laxative types, you can offer procalopride. Like I said, it used to be women only. Um, and then for pregnancy, obviously you don't want to give any drugs whatsoever if you can avoid them. So the first thing you want to do is um, advise them to increase fiber. Then you can give fiber supplements. Then you can give bulk forming and then uh, osmotic. And if need be, then you can give the stimulant laxative. Uh, you want to avoid senna near term. And it's the same pattern for someone who's breastfeeding. And for children, again, you want to start with fiber and fluid intake. Then you give your osmotic, which is macrogol. And then if they remain hard, you can give lactulose or docusate sodium. Now, this is what I meant by mnemonics to remember this. So, give me just a second to find it in my book. 
So what, what I've done is, what I would suggest you do is you write down the classes of drugs and you just take the first letter, for example, for... Let's look at opioid-induced constipation. Um, you give an osmotic, then you give a bulk forming. So it will be OB, N for naloxagol. And for example, short duration, you would give bulk forming, you give an osmotic, and then a stimulant, so it would be BOS, BOS. So you'll find that I think um, BOS is used for short and chronic, and then OS would be used for uh, would be used for opioid. The reason why is obviously because you will avoid the bulk forming in opioid-induced constipation. Yeah, you do not use you do not use bulk forming for induced. Uh, constipation but that's how I remembered it that's how I wrote it in my notes I just used the first letters from the classes and I put them next to the 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 treatment plan so for example short duration I knew it was BOS for opioids I knew it was just OS for fecal impaction it was BOS um, that just helped me remember as a tip you don't have to use it but it's there as an option um, okay so we have got four more questions before okay someone else has entered the room We've got about four more questions to go, so they'll be getting slightly more challenging, I'd say. The next question says, patients come to you asking for constipation relief with the strongest thing you've got. However, there are different classes of laxatives for different effects. A stimulant constipation treatment would include... Okay, all 12 people. <clears throat> all right, so while we're voting, I just wanna go over, I found the section in my notes that had them. So for short duration was BOS, for chronic I had BOS, um, for pregnancy was BOS, so I put all the BOS ones first, and then for opioid induced was OSN, and then for impaction was OSE, and then for children was OS, osmotic, and then stimulant. So that's how I remembered them. All right, so we have, yeah, literally 16 people have voted for Senna. So there's no need to even carry on polling. I guess this one was an easy question. Um, Senna is a stimulant laxative. Docusate is a stool softener. Propyl ethylene glycol is an osmotic. And psyllium is a fiber or a bulk forming. You can think of psyllium as a... It's made from husk of a certain plant, so you can think of that as is fahula husk, okay? Great stuff. So now we look at diarrhea. We've looked at constipation and its relative or its brother, if you like, is diarrhea. The first thing about diarrhea you need to recognize is the red flag signs and symptoms because you will be most likely tested on this. So the red flag signs and symptoms for diarrhea, knowing when to refer, include anyone who's having an unexplained weight loss, any kind of rectal bleeding, any persistent diarrhea over a long period of time, any systemic illness or uh, if someone has traveled recently, which could be due to, for example, a, a bacteria of some kind. So for first line, we have ORT, which is just oral rehydration therapy. We give those in sachets mainly. You can also have loperamide first line. Um, and you need to know the age restrictions for loperamide. Uh, ciprofloxacin can be used for prophylaxis against traveler's diarrhea, but it's not recommended to be used routinely. When do you not use bulk forming? Yeah, that's, that's right, opioid induced. So loperamide, like I was saying, you need to know the age restrictions, not licensed over the counter if someone's under the age of 12. Um, oral rehydration therapy. This is just a way to replace fluids that have been lost due to someone um, losing so much water. Um, and it's literally just replacing salts, like specifically sodium and potassium mainly. It can also be given by a nasal gastric tube in hospitals. Okay, so the next question is going to be about traveler's diarrhea. A patient who knows he will be going into an area with poor water quality and that he might have to take a prescription medicine on his travels, which medication would 
best treat infectious diarrhea. Interesting, 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 interesting. All right, someone vote for loperamide. Um, the, the key here is to read the question. Um, although loperamide can be given, there's, not, there's nothing to say you, you couldn't give loperamide or you couldn't give bismuth. It's just that we're speaking specifically about someone who wants something prophylactically traveling, something that's gonna uh, cure the bacteria. The water might not be as clean where they're traveling to and it may contain certain bacteria, and so they take medication to kind of help prevent them getting ill before they get ill. Okay, that's what prophylaxis means, is what you do in advance before you actually catch the condition. The actual correct answer were six and out of nine. Okay, I'm going to end the I'm gonna end the voting. Yeah, I'm gonna end the voting. Uh, yeah, so the session is meant to run until eight, but we're just I'm gonna finish anyway, okay? So I should be done in about 15 minutes for those that were asking. Most people got it right, they said ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin is an antibiotic that you might use for infectious diarrhea. Now the quinolone stem here is oxacin. Remember I talked about stems? Um, but fluoroquinolones, some may be slightly confused about quinolones and fluoroquinolones, but the only difference between qu quinolones and fluoroquinolones is that fluoroquinolones have fluorine atom inside them, the FL in them, but nearly all quinolones are also fluoroquinolones, so the difference doesn't really matter to us that much. Um, one way you may remember quinolones is that they're used for they use um, in UTIs quite frequently. Um, if if you've ever watched a TV show called uh, Medicine Woman, Dr. Quinn in that show was a woman, and Dr. Quinn may help you remember because women tend to have more UTIs than men. Um, so by cutting out the fluxacin stem from the generic name ciprofloxacin, the manufacturers made up the name the brand name Cipro. So Bismuth subsalicylate, atropine, loperamide are all antidiarrheals, so you're correct, but um, none of them would help to eliminate a bacterial infection. They're not antibacterials, and that's why. Um, uh, hope that's clear. If there are any questions, let me know. All right, so we look at dyspepsia now. So with dyspepsia, the non-drug treatment would be healthy eating, um, weight loss, avoiding trigger foods, smaller meals, evening meals, um, having those three to four hours before you go to bed, and sometimes raising the head of your bed, stopping smoking, reducing alcohol consumption, reducing stress and anxiety. Um, and you want to refer those people over the age of 55. Does anyone know why you would refer someone age 55 plus? Um, for drug treatment, you would uh, review drugs that can cause dyspepsia, including... Now, there's, there's a lot of drugs which can contribute to dyspepsia, so I'm just going to run through a few. Uh, alpha blockers, antimuscarinics, aspirin, benzos, beta blockers, bisphosphonates, calcium channel blockers, uh, corticosteroids, nitrates, a lot of drugs. So you might just want to review the medication the patient is on if nothing is helping. Um, antacids can be used for short term. Initial management for dyspepsia can be, it depends on if you're looking at functional dyspepsia, you may have a test for H. pylori and if that's the case you go for H. pylori eradication um, or you can start slow with the H2 blockers and then build up to the PPIs. If it's recurrent dyspepsia you want to review the medication as I said because there's a lot of medications that can cause dyspepsia. Um, you may also want to give a low dose um, H2 blocker or PPI when required, PRN. Um, consider also changing if someone's on NSAIDs. I hope that makes sense. All right, so we'll look at a question on emesis, which is related to what we're doing. It says, if you look at your screen, when treating nausea and vomiting, we have to be aware of three types of emesis. Which of the following is not a type of emesis that a patient might have? Um, sorry for the spelling mistakes with this one. Emesis is just vomiting, basically.
Actually, I don't think there's a spelling error. I think emesis is plural and emesis is singular. So one of the things you'll have to do, um, as I was telling you, so I've got this book or this notepad where I just wrote the most important concept, regardless of class. Can you explain again, please, how ciprofloxacin works for traveler's diarrhea? It's not so much of how it actually works, how the quinolones work. It's, it's, it's about the class and what the drug does. It's an antibacterial. And so when you're traveling to an area that is likely to contain bacteria in the water you drink or in the food you're eating, you just take it prophylaxis. Yeah, it's just for prof prophylaxis. That's what the question was asking. Yeah, I hope that's clear. So 12 out of 19, 13 people have voted. Um, the answer is anterograde actually. Uh, yeah, anterograde refers to a type of amnesia actually, where a patient might have trouble forming new memories, which is as opposed to retrograde amnesia, where you have trouble remembering the most recent memories or memories in the past. So the different types of emesis you might have include anticipatory, anticipatory nausea, which is triggered by a memory of a very severe nausea. If you've had a an event in the past and you're kind of anticipating that to happen and then it happens. Acute just happens a few minutes after giving a medication um, and then delayed emesis would happen a day later or it could happen 48 to 72 hours after for example someone's taken chemotherapy. And so when we look at um, malignant disease chapter in the BNF you'll notice that there are different treatments or different drugs you would give depending on what type of emesis someone has. Um, for example, those that would help psychologically would help with uh, retrograde, would help with um, anticipatory, anticipatory emesis. But we'll look at that in more detail when we look at uh, malignant disease. Okay, antacids, we've briefly gone over antacids, but you want to give them again between meals and you want to give them at bedtime. Um, one of the monics that I use or that people have told me about is MAX, which is magnesium, is laxative and uh, or abc which is aluminium can cause constipation because they're the first three letters of the alphabet abc whatever mnemonic helps you to remember them i suggest you just remember them because that definitely might come up sodium bicarbonate is generally no longer prescribed alone but it is helpful when it is given for utis and acid and acidosis bismuth can be neurotoxic just remember that and also by the way bismuth subsalicylate um, contains salicylic acid in it and for that reason you don't want to give it to people under the age of 16 um, because of the risk of causing rye syndrome rye syndrome is the why well, we don't give aspirin to young people as well but then aspirin also contains um, salicylic acid component calcium can be calcium can induce rebound rebound acid secretion I remember someone asking about calcium before so the one thing you want to watch out for calcium is rebound acid secretion and cymeticone reduces flotulence. I haven't got cymeticone on the screen. And then alginates, alg alginates or alginates, however you pronounce it, they just form a raft over the top of your, of your acid so that it doesn't shoot up into your esophagus and causes heartburn. Because really what causes heartburn is when the acid comes up to your esophagus. So they basically form this barrier, this thick hard barrier over it and prevents the acid from shooting up. That would be your um, uh, your peptic your peptac. Um, those will be the alginates. All right, this is a really good question, and it actually refers to draws on your knowledge from a few subjects. And this is the perfect kind of questions you would have in the exam. They will draw on multiple areas of the BNF or multiple multiple um, systemic areas. Yes, yeah, calcium is um, has been known to cause rebound reflux. So the question is basically asking you, it says that um, 5-HT is a way of representing serotonin. Everybody knows that, no fun in telling you. Um, but often the numbers and mechanism of action can get mixed up and boy did I mix these up. So we believe on Dancitron, Mechanism of action is a 
5-HT1 or 5-HT3, is it an antagonist or is it an agonist? And I'll give you a quick way of remembering this. I have a quick trick to remember this. So once I tell you the answer, you should never forget. I'm going to wait at least until we've got at least half of people voted. Uh, Pro Plus, you put the answer in the chat. Just click on the just click on the link, and uh, your vote will go through. Just click on whatever you think the answer is. I'll give you ten seconds, and then I'll end the polling, and we'll look at what the answer is, and I'll tell you a way to remember it so you don't forget. Okay, most people said five H three antagonist. Correct. So, <clears throat> 5-HT3 antagonist represents ondansetron's mechanism of action. Now, if you look at ondansetron, the citron part is the suffix, and which will help you to remember its class. Um, remember how we looked at prazole? Remember ondansetron class uh, will help you to remember all drugs that are serotonin 5-HT3 receptor antagonists. Um, it's used to prevent uh, MSs, obviously. Um, sometimes you may see it as a um, as melt, like Zofran melt or ODT, which stands for orally disintegrating tablet. Now, this formulation is useful because it dissolves at the top of the tongue and requires doesn't require you to take any additional fluid. Um, and if you're good at if you're any good at word scrambles, you will realize that on Dancitron actually has every single letter from um, serotonin except the I. Um, sumatriptan, which you guys might be thinking about, sumatriptan is a migraine medication and that's the 5-HT1 agonist. Okay, so you have um, sumatriptan, 5-HT1 agonist and ondansetron, okay? I'm a 5-HT1 agonist, not antagonist, and 5-HT3 antagonist. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so um, really running out of time, unfortunately. Let me see. I've only got five more slides. I've got five more questions. Oh, no, I've got, um, got two more questions, three more slides, so it shouldn't take us too long. Right, so... Peptic ulcer disease, I'm just going to go over this quickly and then I'll look at some of the questions you've asked later at the end. So peptic ulcer disease is mainly caused by NSAIDs and H. pylori, we've looked at this. Stress can also contribute and some of the risk factors we looked at include people over the age of 65, but you'd refer anyone over the age of 55. We looked at taking high doses of NSAIDs and drugs that increase the risk. I gave several examples. Uh, someone who's a heavy smoker or taking excessive alcohol. Uh, Non-drug treatment would be the same as we looked at for dyspepsia and drug treatment would be the same as well. Again, you want to review the patient after six to eight months um, and see if it's working out for them. Sucrophate is one that we haven't really looked at, but it may act by protecting the mucosa. That's the cell or the layers of the stomach. It is composed of aluminium and sucrose. Okay. This is the second. This is the last question. All right. This is the last question, and I want uh, as many of you guys to vote on it as you can. There, there are many treatments, none of which are curative for inflammatory bowel disease. Which of the following medication classes best demonstrates in which class infliximab would belong to? Let me give you another tip here. So, infliximab also has a suffix. Believe it or not. So the ending of infliximab, MAB, stands for monoclonal antibody, which is the target of these drugs. Immunomodulators and immunosuppressants sound similar, um, but when you have drugs like 5-aminosalicylate, um, examples of the aminosalicylates include uh, sulfasalazine and mesalazine. And then you have the glucocorticoids, which can include hydrocortisone and dexamethasone, or you have the immunosuppressants, which include azathioprine, cyclosporin, and even methotrexate. 
So the correct answer would be immunomodulators rather than immunosuppressants. Okay, the MAB ending should um, immediately trigger that this is a biological molecule or a biologic if you want. Some immunosuppressants do work on TNF-alpha, but not all of them. Um, like I said, we do do a separate take on um, immunosuppressants uh, when we look at the mus musculoskeletal system. Okay, so lastly, we're going to look at PPIs and um, H2 blockers, and then we're done. So with the H2 blockers, there's not really much to say, but these are just um, weaker than PPIs. Generally, they're well tolerated, not too many side effects, and you can buy them over the counter. You can buy ranitidine, uh, 75 milligrams, um, half of the one you get behind the behind the counter, I mean, um, on prescription. Um, one thing to remember, though, is cymetidine. Cymetidine has a lot of... It's, it's a potent enzyme inhibitor. So there's a lot of clinically significant interactions. Um, you're rarely going to see cimetidine anymore. It's really, I haven't seen cimetidine for years. But if you do see cimetidine, then you want to think of things like, is the patient on warfarin? Are they taking phenytoin or diazepam? Um, because it can have a serious, um, can have serious side effects. Um, for PPIs, there's a blue box warning for SCLE, which is um, sub subacute lupus erythematous. Um, it's basically like a reaction that can occur. It can actually occur even after someone has recently taken PPIs for a very long period of time. Um, usually it's resolved by withdrawing the drug. What it looks like is you would see lesions on the skin, which will be accompanied with arthralgia. For anyone who doesn't know, arthralgia is joint pain. Think of arthritis. So when it comes to treating GERD, again, the drug treatments are going to be the same as dyspepsia and sort of the non-drug treatment and the drug treatment are going to be the same as dyspepsia. Um, for pregnancy, again, we first want to focus on lifestyle changes and maybe go easy with the antacids and the alginates because those are less likely to have any um, effects. And then for the more severe cases, we can look at omeprazole and renitidine, the PPIs and the proton pump inhibitors. Um, PPIs actually can increase. So initially someone asked me about PPIs and um, I think you mentioned uh, one of the side effects of PPIs, but they have they have several side effects. Um, one of them is that they can increase the risk of having C. difficile. Um, that's if you use high doses for a long time, which could be like a year or longer. They can also increase the risk of osteoporosis and related fractures of the hip or the wrist or the spine. And in fact, prolonged use of them can also cause a reduction in absorption of vitamin B12, which is also psycho cyanocobalamin. All right, that's another thing I had on my list uh, to learn all the vitamins. The absorption, uh, some of the other effects that they can have is interactions. So they can interact with medication that someone might be taking. For example, um, PPS can reduce the absorption of um, ketoconazole. Uh, they can also increase the absorption of digoxin. That means increase it and probably increase the risk of having digoxin toxicity. But they can also have different um, interactions depending on what you're taking. For example, omeprazole is, has been known to be linked uh, to increase the breakdown of drugs like uh, like warfarin and um, even, even um, clopidogrel. It's actually not recommended that you prescribe omeprazole and or any anymore. Let me look at the gastric cancer masking. Yes, that's correct as well. Gastric cancer masking. That's something I didn't have, but that's absolutely correct. Um, the last thing I had here was the different treatment regimens for um, H. pylori eradication. I don't think you have to memorize these per se, um, but I think you have to be aware of them and know them. At least know all the antibiotics that can be used um, for the different situations. So you have cases where someone might be penicillin, penicillin allergic, so then you would do away with amoxicillin. If they're not, then you would give them amoxicillin. So like for example, triple therapy would start with a PPI and then the two antibiotics. The reason why we give the two antibiotics is because you want to have a broad spectrum antibiotic to cover, and then you want to have a narrow spectrum antibiotic as well. So the ones that are going to go specifically at the bacteria 
Uh, the treatment times can vary depending on what you're given. As you can see, if you've only learned one, for example, triple therapy, the first one, um, you may not be aware that there's um, about four or five other things you can you can give. Um, Rifabutin is one that people may not be aware of. Uh, so yeah, I would say just memorize, just go through them. The way I did it was just to take the first letter and create um, word, word mnemonics to help me remember. Um, no, PPIs can reduce the absorption of uh, B12, not increase it. No, it um, it increases the absorption of of digoxin, so it increases digoxin toxicity. It can increase, um, so breaking digoxin down in the liver. Hope that makes sense. All right, so that's everything that I had prepared for the GI system. Hopefully it gets you guys thinking and to practice some questions and think of exam technique. Um, thank you all for taking part. It was really good to see that we had more than half people participating in the polls. Um, if there's anything that you guys think we could we could do better, if, there, if you have any suggestions, any tips, what you guys want to see next, and how much depth you feel we should go in in future slides, um, in future presentations, then please give us feedback on the website. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't give anything to a pregnant woman over the counter, um, except give her advice. If anything, refer. If anything, I would refer. If someone's pregnant, yeah, it's it's very highly highly risky. Okay, did you guys find the questions easy? Did you find them hard? Um, let me know so that next time we can adjust the difficulty levels. I realize that not everyone got them all correct, which is which is all right. I mean, you still have time. You still have time, so it's not much to worry about. But I will say this, though, before I end. Uh, the GI is perhaps one of the easiest modules to get your head around um, because it's just...